I'm pleased to see that we have so many people here. Um, I'm afraid we haven't got any more chairs. Um, so, about one minute early, let me introduce Adrian Seibold. And the title is here, An Introduction to Pi MC3. So, take it away. Yep, okay. Um, so I'm Adrian, as he said, or Adrian. Um, I'm one of the developers of PyMC and kind of more with a mathematical background and a bit of biology, I guess. And I'm going to try to give a short introduction for PyMC for you today. And just before I start, uh, just quick, quickly, uh, who has actually used PyMC before? Anyone here? Okay, a couple of people, yeah. So what is PyMC? It's a Bayesian package for statistics, and that's supposed to do something here. That's better. Um, so basically, it lets you specify mathematical models of some data sets and then quantify your uncertainty in some parameters. What you can basically do is mostly everything you learn in an introductory introduction for um, statistics, so you can do stuff like t-tests, you can do linear models, generalized linear model survival analysis, or if you kind of want ANOVA stuff. Um, you can also do kind of a bit more advanced statistical uh, models like hierarchical models, also called multi-level models or mixed models. And also kind of interestingly, I guess, um, problems where you have a more detailed mathematical model of the process that you're actually interested in. And as we yesterday heard in the keynote, or I think before the keynote actually, um, all we now do is neural networks. So if you really want to, I heard you can also do neural, neural networks in PyMC. I've never done it myself, but apparently it works. So just to give you a very quick thing, kind of what's the difference between um, the Bayesian approach and the more well-known, I guess, frequentist approach, would be if you, for example, have a linear model where you just model a regression line or something like that, it would usually give you kind of one fit. So for each parameter, it gives you one value, and then it gives you maybe a bunch of p-values or something that tell you, okay, I'm this sure about that. That seems to be really positive, something like that. In the Bayesian approach, it's more like, okay, I don't just want one explanation for my data set, but I kind of want all of them. I want all reasonable explanations from my data set given a model. I'll go into more detail what I actually mean by that in a minute. So what do we need to put into a model to get started with PyMC? So first, of course, we need some observations, some measurements or something, and we need a rule for making up new data sets. Um, one way of thinking about that rule, the, the actual model, would be that you kind of imagine you're an evil scientist or something like that who is too lazy to actually run an experiment. So you just simulate data and then you could basically publish that because nobody really wants to do that, to, to actually run, run experiments. So um, you want to have a rule for making up data sets that will kind of fool other people that is detailed enough that other people wouldn't pick up on, okay, no, that data set is just stupid. There's a negative length in there, or, okay, it just doesn't make any sense. It's really weird somehow. Um, how such a rule could look like, for example, let's say we, so I just, it's all without PyMC for now, because I thought maybe you don't know that yet, but maybe you know the um, stats model, uh, the, statistics package in SciPy. So we just want to make up a data set where we have two groups and they may differ in a mean value. So you have mostly normal distributed data and one is just maybe a bit higher than the other. So how you could go about doing something like that is you just define a function and you say, okay, what's the mean, the, the overall mean of all my values? And you just pick a number um, that should kind of for your application be something reasonable, I hope. So to really pick that right, you'd have to have a bit of 
background knowledge about your, your field. Um, then, interesting part, you pick an effect size. So how different are the you two groups? I mean, what's the difference between men and women in particular <laughs> task or whatever? Um, so how do you pick something like that? Okay, maybe you don't want, if you generate lots of data sets, you don't want to pick an effect size that's gigantic all the time. You usually want to, f to pick effect sizes that are kind of smallish. So you might want to, to choose a student t distribution for that with uh, three degrees of freedom. That's kind of looks a bit like a normal distribution, but has much wider tails. So you kind of get much more high effects than you would um, with a normal distribution. Then you pick your sigma. So just, okay, how, how much dispersion is there in, in your data set? And again, we use a student t distribution here, but we take the absolute value of that. And then we compute the mean of the one group and the mean of the second group. So that the difference between the two groups is just the effect size. And then you just draw random values for your measurements. We could just use a normal distribution here, but that might be a bit suspect if you don't have any outliers in your data set. I mean, in real experiment, there's always something that goes wrong. So maybe just pick a student t distribution too with uh, seven degrees of freedom, that basically looks like a normal distribution, but from time to time that'll mix in really weird measurements that are just off. So that would kind of be a model. And in PyMC, you would write the same thing just a little bit differently, like this. So note that we don't have a function that generates data sets, but instead we have a context where we just declaratively tell PyMC how that model looks like. So the mean before, we just drew a random number. Now we tell PyMC, okay, the mean is, follows a normal distribution with certain uh, set mu and standard deviation. Then we pick an effect size, we pick a sigma, we compute the mean one and mean two, and we have our data distribution. And we also tell it that it's actually an observed data set. Oh, you can't actually see that in here. So we have the actual data set somewhere. I'll later show you that in, in the notebook that you can play around with that a bit. Um, so here you can also see a bit of a difference between those three parameters and those two. Those three are what we call free parameters. So we don't have actual values for them. Those are observed parameters because we actually, in a real application, we ha already have measurements for those. So those are the things we want to know, those are the things we actually know. So earlier I said we're trying to give you all reasonable explanations for a data set given a model. So the model is what we just wrote down. It's a rule how we think that data set was generated. Um, so we can go through, I guess, a couple of different words in that. So what would be an explanation for a data set? Okay, that would just be specific values for all the free parameters. So one explanation for the data set would be, okay, the effect is 0.1, sigma is 2, and um, what was the third? Oh, the mean is 3, maybe. That would be an explanation for the data set. That could be a good explanation or bad explanation, depends. And... Um, so kind of the interesting point here is, I guess, what we mean by reasonable, what's a reasonable explanation. And by that, we mean actually two different things. So first, we want reasonable explanations to be something that could have potentially been produced by our rule for generating data sets. If it were some, so for example, if sigma were 10,000, that would not be a reasonable explanation because yet, yeah, 10,000 just doesn't happen if we draw the random numbers as we just specified. And the second thing, it also needs to explain the data set. So if the difference between the observed values is really huge in the two groups, then an effect size of zero would kind of not be reasonable because it doesn't explain the data set. Also note that both are not all or nothing things, but kind of gradual things. So actually a probability for both parts. So what's the probability that our three parameters were produced by our data generation process, by our model? 
that's a probability. And how likely is it to generate our actual data sets given our um, given an explanation? That would be a probability too. So the first probability is called the prior, usually written as just P of theta. And the second one would be the likelihood, the probability of observing the data given our parameters. And what we are interested in now is what's the probability of our parameters given our data set. So we kind of want that to be high when both the prior probability, the probability that our generation process produced the parameters and the likelihood are both large, then that's a good sign that it's actually a good explanation for the whole data set. So we want a posterior to be high. And that's just what we get if we multiply the two probabilities. And a bit of probability theory, not, definitely not complicated, shows you that that's actually the law that would explain that. Um, so now we kind of know what reasonable would mean in a mathematical sense. Now, how do we, in a, say, in a sense, say, okay, give me all reasonable explanations for a data set? And the all is, of course, a bit, yeah, we can't actually do that. There's an infinite number of explanations, and it's kind of some are better and, than others, so we can't really give you all. What we instead do is we give you a representative sample. So you can say, okay, I want to have a thousand different explanations for my data set in a way that the more reasonable explanations will be in that sample more, with a higher probability than the other ones. And that's basically the central task that PyMC does. That's the really hard part where a lot of math comes in and um, boils down to, from the user's point of view, to basically just two options how, you, how to do that. The first one is just sample, which will just give us our, our, um, our samples from the posterior, or we could use variational inference. I'm not going to go into that much for reasons that I'll mention a bit later, I guess. So, at that point, I think it's maybe useful to just show you that which we just did in an actual notebook. Is that large enough? Okay, so we just import some stuff, we generate a data set, so we don't actually use a real data set, we'll just pretend we'll use that one. So we kind of have one group of values here and another group of values here, and we want to ask, okay, is there a difference between the two? Um, that's kind of hard to see by eye, I guess. Um, also, if we kind of plot them as a distribution plot, it still kind of looks a bit like maybe the red is a bit lower, but kind of hard to see. So what we do now We'll just write down the model we had earlier. So we say, okay, we have a mean. The mean is just going to be, what, 3.5 probably, something like that. And if we just use the exact same model that we generated the data from, the mean was three and the standard deviation was one. then we'll have a variable for the effect. And a variable for sigma. is just the mean minus half of the effect. And the actual, oh no, let's call it the same as.
Where? This? No, it's supposed to be new. Yeah, the degrees of freedom. So we'd kind of say, okay, how much, um, how much outliers we have in that distribution. So it doesn't really look a lot like the normal distribution, but more kind of more in the tails. And we want that thing. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> that's right, okay. <laughs> And we want the same for the second data set. And apparently I did make a mistake somewhere. Yeah, I forgot a new. And another one? Yeah, another new. Okay, and now we'll just sample that. So that's, that's the interesting part that I'm not going into how much how that works. And it's actually compiling something in the background which usually shouldn't take that long. I'm not using mean too. Ah, uh, yeah. That's a bad idea. Yeah, that looks better. So what we have now is a trace. That's just a collection of possible explanations for the data set we've seen. So the first one would, for example, be this one. Now just ignore the lower bound stuff. That's just internal stuff because it's bound to be neg it has to be negative. But for example, one explanation for our data set would be sigma is that value, and mean is that value, and the effect has that value. A different explanation would be, okay, those, or that. Okay, so we could also say, okay, we want to extract all effect variables. Then we get an array of all the possible explanations for our effect variable and we could make a plot of those. Oh, did I? Live coding is very dangerous. So basically I said the effect has to be positive in the model, so it only included positive values for the effect. That's kind of how I said, okay, the, the data was generated, so it only gave me explanations that had that. That looks better. Okay, so those would be the different explanations it, it came up with. And in the sense, we can say from a mathematical point of view, it's kind of a representative sample, so we can say that's actually all of them. So we can see, okay, it's probably negative. So the second actually is lower. Here. Which is kind of hard to see by eye, but that's what, what it says here. Okay.
different part, a very important part of the whole thing is kind of, okay, what can go wrong in the whole process? And there are two different kinds of things that can go wrong. One thing is we don't actually get a representative sample, but something different. And the second thing that can go wrong is our model is maybe stupid. So what I did before, when I wrote the half student T, so I assumed that the effect was positive, that's kind of, doesn't make any sense, doesn't fit the data set well, and wasn't actually what's go what was going on. Um, PyMC can't really directly help us with the second one. So kind of the mathematics, from a mathematical point of view, we're just assuming that that model is actually the truth. We can play around a bit later and, and see that there are ways to figure out, okay, that doesn't really make sense maybe, to, figure, uh, to, to see that in the data set, but that's really for the user to figure out in a particular data set. The first thing is very important part, and um, the trouble here is that basically we allow you to write any model you want. So you can make it arbitrarily complicated and you can write things down that are just not possible to actually do from a mathematical point of view, kind of with our current algorithms that we have. So um, there's no way we can write a sampler that would work for all models. What we instead try to do is tell users if we think that something is wrong. So we have a whole bunch of diagnostics that mostly work automatically and tell you, okay, something doesn't work, but some of them aren't automatic. You have to do a bit, bit of work uh, yourself in there. And it's really important that if you run into trouble like that, you actually take it seriously, because if you get warnings, and yeah, you, the results might just be nonsense, basically. Um, Oh, that's a couple of my notes on the slides that <laughs> they weren't supposed to end up on there. But anyway, so kind of things that might come up are divergences. That's kind of, it will warn you about that. I'll show you an example of that in a minute. That's kind of the really worst thing that can happen. If you get divergences, you know the results might just be wrong. Um, you can get warnings about tree sizes. That's kind of not so bad. That means maybe it's not very efficient. And you should usually look at our hat, that's also called Gelman-Rubin um, statistic, that tells you if you rerun the analysis, do you get the same results? So if you kind of run the same things twice, you kind of don't want to have completely different things, and that's a way to check that. And um, you can have a look at the effective sample size and trace plots. So I'll just give you little example of something. So oh, first, I want, actually wanted to show you here how it looks like if everything worked, which it did here. So we can have a look at the trace plot, for example. That's just, OK, this is the first explanation, the first set of parameters, then comes the second, and we just plot those. And we kind of want that to be a really zigzaggy thing that just goes up and down and we want kind of a pretty smooth line fit over here. So those all kind of look, look okay. Then you could have a look, oh, and when sampling, we didn't get any warnings. That's kind of the first good thing. Then we want to have a look at Gelman-Rubin, and that gives us values that are close to one, which is good. Values that are larger than one are a problem. And we can have a look at the effective sample size. Though, kind of, so we kind of said, okay, we get a thousand samples, um, uh, but maybe they are kind of not really a thousand, in a, in a sense. So the effective sample size is kind of an estimate of how many do we actually have, and that looks fine too. So now, I'll give you an example where that doesn't work. That's really simple model, kind of, but the probably the most difficult thing for the sampler that, that you can come up with, or one of the most difficult ones. Um, we just have two variables. We have the logarithm of some standard deviation, and we draw a normal distribution with that standard deviation. 
and yeah, we get a whole bunch of warnings in this case. And Gelman Rubin, for example, tells us, okay, that isn't one. And the effective sample size, that isn't thousand, a thousand. What's actually going on in more detail, you can see if you just look at the scatter plot. So you look at all the standard deviations and you look at, at all the values. If the log of the standard deviation is really small, then kind of all of the values are in here somewhere. If the log of the standard deviation is very high, then the values are kind of here. And this is what we call a funnel, which the sampler can't really deal with any, anymore. In this particular case, it's actually easy to fix. We can just put a one in here. So we just say, okay, we have a normal distribution here and our standard deviation here, and then we just scale our standard normal to have that standard deviation. That's a trick that you can do in larger models too, and that, that actually works pretty well. For example, in this case, all the warnings go away. And you can see actually the trace, the, the samples actually look different now. So the, the earlier results actually were wrong. Yeah, so if we kind of get cases where the sampler can't deal with it well, then we can try to reparameterize. That's what I just did. You just find a different way of saying the exact same model. So the data generation process stays exactly the same, but your parameters change a bit what, what they actually mean. Or you could change the model in some way. So that's actually a very common thing is that if you have a model that just doesn't fit the data set at all, then often the sampler will actually have trouble with that. So it's usually a good sign if the sampler is fine, then doesn't mean your model is, is great either, but the other way around often works surprisingly well. So if, you, if the sampler doesn't like your, your model, then there's a good chance your model is actually just doesn't, doesn't make much sense. Um, the other kind of problem I mentioned was kind of, okay, the, the model doesn't, work from, from, from the start. The model doesn't fit the data set. Um, and I can give you a short example of that too. So we have here a data set. So this is actually a real data set, not something we simulated. Um, that's just the returns of some um, trading algorithm that's trading with stocks. And on some days it makes money, on other days it loses money, and we kind of want to figure out, kind of, does it do something useful, does it actually earn money over time? So a, simple, a very simple model and a pretty wrong model would be, okay, we just assume we have mu, we have a mean, the mean of that thing, and we have a standard deviation, and then we just have our observations here, the returns on the individual days, with that mean and that standard deviation. So we sample from that. Works, doesn't complain about anything, which kind of usually is actually a good sign, but in this case it isn't. Now we can ask, okay, given that we now have a bit more knowledge about our model, how would we actually think, what, what would be other good explanation, other good data sets that would kind of match our understanding of that trading algorithm? That's kind of what we call a posterior predictive distribution. So, yeah, while, while that does its thing, we can just actually have a look at the, well, at the results of that. That would, for example, look like that. So our model now thinks data sets typically look like that. And if we compare that to the actual data set, yeah, no, our data set actually looks different than our model thinks our data set should look like. 
in this case, a simple fix for that would be to uh, switch out the normal distribution for student t distribution again to just have a bit more outliers on, on the ends to get those large values. There are actually better ways of dealing with that in that particular case. For example, um, you can assume that the standard deviation changes over time. That actually fits that, model, that data set much better. But uh, I'm not going to go into that. Um, Then earlier I said, okay, we can also look at more detailed mathematical models of um, data sets. And for that, I've got another, I think, pretty nice um, example. That's um, groundwater flow. So if you just imagine this is an island and we have kind of a map of the underground, of the ground. And there are some regions under the ground where water can travel pretty well. That's the dark stuff here. And we have regions where water can't really travel at all, or not very well. So different kinds of rock, for example. And now we imagine we just put a little um, well in the middle and pump out lots and lots of water. Then, OK, at first, kind of the water from the immediate area around it will flow to the well and we'll pump that away. And the longer we pump, um, the more, the wider the area will be where we kind of pump the water away. And water will flow, flow from the outside. Now we assume that on the border of that whole thing, so maybe that's an island, and there's a lake around that, so we don't pump that much, that the lake will, will kind of change. So, um, on the border, we kind of have a fixed water level that's not going to change no matter how much we pump. But we pump a lot of stuff until it's just flowing, all of the water is flowing from the outside, from the lake to our, our well. And while we do that, now we might, for example, say, okay, we have a small well here and here and here and here maybe, and we check, okay, what's the pressure in there? And from that pressure, we would like to infer this distribution here. We would like to figure out, okay, where can the water actually travel well and where can it not travel well? So we actually have a rather curious data set there then because we only have maybe five observations, namely the pressure at those different wells. But we have a whole bunch of parameters, much, much more parameters than observations because we actually have as parameter a whole function, how the whole thing underground looks like. And we kind of want to have all possible explanations that, that fit our data set well, and that also kind of make sense, are kind of reasonable um, things, how the um, transmissivity, transmissivi <laughs> how, um, how well the water can, can um, travel under the ground there. Um, and we actually can describe that process of pumping out the water from the ground with a um, partial differential equation. Um, not, again, we don't really have the time to go into that, I guess, but just to give you an idea, so we have a detailed mathematical model of how that actually works, and we want to put that in our statistical model of the data set. So, we kind of do a whole, what, what, what we do is we have a mesh where we kind of say, okay, we evaluate our function on only these points where things intersect. And then we assume it's just straight lines in between. Um, and if we do a bit of work here, we could, for example, end with something like that. So that would kind of be the ground truth. This is, okay, here's our well. This is where the water is going, is, is flowing. So you notice it's kind of, most of it is flowing here that way, and only little is flowing that way and that way, because there the water can't travel well through the, um, to, through the ground. Um, and, oh, the red dots are where our wells are. There we take measurements. Then we kind of forget that whole ground truth 
and just take those measurements. So that's, that's the pressure at those points. And now we try to reconstruct what the actual um, function look, looked like. Bit more code. And this is then our actual model. And yeah, most of the thought actually goes into here that squared error op. That's kind of the point where the two, two things intersect. And what we get out now would be something like this, where we have now um, the true conductivity. That's the true values. <laughs> so this would be the true values, and that would be one particular explanation that matches our data set. Could also have a look at a different one. Oh, no, that one. So that would kind of explain our measurements too. And so would that one, funnily enough. So kind of if we just had one point estimate, like, okay, that's what we think our conductivity looks like, we would kind of lose a whole lot of information because knowing what we actually know and knowing all the possible solutions that explain our data set can kind of be a very useful thing. So we kind of have a couple of thousand or pretty much as many as we want of, of those. Um, now what can we do with that? For example, we could take all of our possible explanations and just take the mean at each point. Then we get this thing. So we can see, okay, many, many of our explanations actually think here is um, water can't travel well through here, which kind of matches reality. And lots of our um, explanations think that the water can't travel here as, and as well, which also matches. And yeah, here it's kind of a bit messed up, I guess. It's actually here, and it thinks, yeah, there's probably something, something over here, actually more here, so it's kind of not perfect. But can't be because we only have a couple of observations. Or we could ask questions like, um, where do we actually know the pressure? Wait, is that? Yeah, that's the right one. So we can say, okay, here are, here's a point, for example, where we don't know the pressure well because the standard deviations in all of our different explanations is very high at that point. While here, between the wells, we actually know the pressure well anyways. So if we, for example, wanted to have another well, then maybe would, we would put it here because we don't know the pressure here any, anyway. So actually having a measurement here would be useful, while having a measurement here wouldn't help us that much because we know that value anyway. I mean, we could actually still put a measurement in here just to figure out if our model actually makes sense. So our model thinks it's sure about that value, so that would be a way to test our model, for example. If we actually have a measurement and that doesn't, doesn't match what, what we'd expect, that would be interesting too. Yeah, I guess that's that. If you have questions. Any questions? Well, I have one to start with. So this, what you said at the end suggests that you uh, can use that for iterating in this kind of exploration. So you say, right, our model says we have uh, too little knowledge here, so that's the most worthwhile point to invest in another whale. Is that correct? Yeah. <laughs> I have a simple one. What does the MC stand for in the name? Monte Mark Carlo or Mark, uh, Mark of Mark Chain? Of chain. Okay. Mark of Chain, Mont uh, so actually it's both. Oh, Mark okay. of Chain, Monte Carlo, MC, MC. So yeah. kind of Pi MC, MC wouldn't sound right. So, right? yeah, okay. I see. <laughs> Thanks. And uh, by the way, are you still working on the library or? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, thank you for an interesting talk. So I have a question. Um, so many, many times we know the posterior distribution from if you take known distributions as, an, um, as your prior. 
So do you use this knowledge to solve this analytically, or is this all done numerically? No, it's done numerically. So um, if you want to do that analy analytically, then, well, there are kind of a couple of things where that works, like five. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, as I said, there are cases where you can do it analytically, but usually it's just really intractable. And, and if you want to get a map estimate from, from this, you just take the mean of, of the set of results you get? Or what um, you if you want a map, uh, so maximum a posteriori, a posteriori um, we actually have a function for that, for that, find map. Actually not a fan of that particularly because, I mean, it depends on the parameterization, for example. So it's kind of not an invariant that's actually property of the distribution, but it's a property of the density of the parameterization. Mm -hmm. So if you change the coordinate system, you kind of get a different result, which doesn't really sound right to me, to be honest. And also, it's a point estimate again. So if you have the chance, you really try to look at the whole, whole posterior, not just uh, point estimates, but yeah. And I'm sorry, if I can have another one. And if you want to uh, do something like Jeffrey's prior or some other uninformative priors for some of your parameters. Uh, you can do that, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> right, anybody else? Uh, thank you very much. Good talk. Um, for uh, I think the first example was a pretty simple one, which is uh, comparable to an A-B test, uh, for instance. Uh, and I think these kind of things you can also uh, work on these kind of analytical solutions or closed format. Uh, um, I think uh, it actually base. would be tricky to do analytically if you kind of allow arbitrary distributions. Yeah, like yeah. If it's if, it's if you if you yeah. assume a Jeffrey's prior, for example, you can if it's completely analytically. arbitrary, then yes. Um, but but therefore, um, I'm wondering, um, would you think that uh, Bayesian statistics would always outperform frequentistic approaches, especially in this kind of uh, simple cases? Or what, what, what is your take on the thing? Would, would, you, would you always prefer Bayesian statistics over frequentistics, or use both, or I actually kind of, you can do both. Yeah. I mean, um, that's kind of been the, this half a century long war in statistics, exactly. frequentist versus Bayesian, and I kind of never really saw the point of that. Yeah, me I too, mean, but I'm can, suffering. <laughs> <laughs> you can do a Bayesian analysis and then look at the frequentist properties of a way of making decisions with that. Yeah. So it really isn't either or you can look at both okay thank you very much right we have time for a couple more questions well if there are no more questions then let's give the speaker another great hand